got enough. Wait. I think I got enough dad jokes to do me for a while. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, everybody's turn in. do that. Let's sing this again. Let's sing Show Us Your Glory. Let's do that four times. I just want you to kind of zone in. 
As you speak to God, okay? Don't, don't worry about the person beside you. Don't worry about the person behind you. And then we're going to go into the chorus right after that like we normally would, okay? Show us your glory. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Let that be your prayer this morning. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. up this morning? Amen? Amen. Amen.
Y'all say Jesus. Jesus. Good morning. Cough drop. Isn't it glorious to know today that the Lord inhabits the praise of his people? Now think about that just for a minute. The maker of heaven and earth desires us to praise him so that he can inhabit our praises. And so what we know, where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst. So you can be assured this morning by faith that God is here. And because we have the assurance from his word, which is absolute truth, that he is here with us this morning, then there should be nothing between you and me that would keep us from hearing from God today. God wants to speak to us a whole lot more than we want to listen. But if we move ourselves as his children into a position to hear, I promise you God will speak. Don't be like us men who assume what our wives are going to say to us and then we respond to an assumption rather than responding to the truth. God wants to speak to us. And within the context of our worship, recognizing that we worship in about six or seven different ways on Sunday morning, that we need to be open to giving God multiple opportunities to speak to us. Because what this corporate experience of worship is about is that we meet God face to face and we are changed from having been in His presence. So my prayer for us today is that change will occur. That our encounter with Almighty God through the Lord Jesus Christ this morning will bring about change. And we will leave this place today different than we were before. I'm glad you're here. I was thinking this morning as I was driving uh, this way from where Vic and I live north of town. What a glorious day it is. What a marvelous thing it is to experience the grace of God. And you know what we've all experienced is grace this morning. Because if it wasn't for His grace, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have been able to get up out of our beds this morning. We wouldn't have been able to come to this place and worship God in spirit and in truth. And I'm glad you're here. And my prayer for you is that we have an encounter with God and it changes us. I wonder this morning before we pray together as the family of God. Oh, by the way, I need to share with you. Um, obviously, I do not have a microphone on. I'm holding one. Brother Allen is preaching for us this morning. One of the things that I discovered years and years and years ago, 40 years ago now, when I was a, a associate pastor of a church in southeastern Kentucky was... I wanted regular opportunities to preach. And my pastor, wonderful fellow that he was, um, allowed me to preach about once every uh, four or five months. And so over the course of the two and a half years I was there as associate pastor, I only preached about five or six times. And so I wanted, when Alan came here, to give him opportunities to speak to us under the guiding hand of God so that he would have opportunity to do this more than he might otherwise have, but also so that you might hear a different voice and you might understand something that he says that maybe I've said too, but you didn't understand because of the way I said it. But we have opportunity because we have wonderful people like Alan here to hear the word of God and to respond to it as well. So I wonder this morning before we... Uh, 
pray together in our corporate family of God prayer time. Uh, if there are those on your heart today that we need to be prayed for. Okay. Thank you, Miss Janet. We'll certainly pray for them. Someone else. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Miss Joanne. We'll certainly pray for you and your family as well. Someone else. Appreciate that, Miss Shirley and the Laws. Someone else? Just a praise that the Lord watched over us last week on the nail bender trip. It was very warm, but we we got a lot of work done that more can be done this week. So, Amen. but we praise Him for the opportunity to serve Him. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Marty. Appreciate that. We certainly need to praise God for getting all our folks back safe and sound. Something else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. We'll certainly pray for Miss Karen. Someone else. Let me ask you to pray for me. I will be leaving on uh, Wednesday morning to fly to Chicago uh, for two days of uh, consultant meetings at Wheaton uh, College. And I would appreciate your prayers that I could travel safely there and back. And uh, we would be able to accomplish the task that God has given us in these days. Something else on your heart this morning. How about unspoken request this morning? God knows every one of those needs, and he is the great needs meeting God. Let's go to, to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we bless you and praise you today. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending your son to die on an old rugged cross for us so that we might be redeemed. We thank you that you and the Godhead decided that plan in eternity past and that you have made that plan available not only to us but to this world. And you have called us to be ministers of righteousness. And so, Father, we as the people of God here at Freedom Church desire to follow you with the whole heart. Father, today, for those who have been mentioned this morning, Father, we don't know all of the details of every need, but we know that you do. We understand that every person is special to you. And every need is significant. And so, Father, we pray that you would intercede on their behalf and that you would meet their needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You are the great God. You are the one who loves us. You are the one who has a perfect will for each of us as well. And this morning, Father, for those who have raised their hand, recognizing that there's a situation or an issue or something in their lives that needs to be given over to you totally and completely. We would just pray today that you would take those things, unburden us, because Jesus said, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, Father, we tend to carry a whole lot more than we need to. And we would just ask today that we would take Jesus' burden on. In his glorious name, we pray this morning. Amen. 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 Why? <laughs> And we need to take time for that to happen and for Miss Joanne.
Oh, it's back. Came back. Don't get. I was. Don't move. I didn't know it the whole time. I was thinking it's even on or not. In and out. Okay. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Just 
Father, we come because all we can do is speak, Jesus. Lord, you are powerful. You are all-knowing. You are the creator of all things. Nothing was created without you. Nothing is unless you say so. Lord, as we go in this time of hearing your word, bless Alan. Give him the words that you have for us today. Open our ears, open our minds, and let us know we've had a fresh touch from you this day. We give you praise and glory for all things. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. <laughs> I love when Chad says what I say. Good morning again. Uh, I'm so glad to be here uh, this morning and to get to share the Word of God with you. Uh, it's always a pleasure and a tremendous uh, responsibility to get to do it. Uh, and I'm thankful for you to put up with me. You get to put up with me. So thank you for your patience. And uh, if you don't mind, we're going to find a scripture today. And uh, 2 Chronicles 7, verses 14 and 15. Second book of Chronicles, verses 14 and 15 of chapter 7. And I'm going to have a pretty funny title uh, with the help of some of the Arkansas people uh, this past week. And the title for our sermon today, or our idea today, would be The Secret Sauce of Spiritual Success. The Secret Sauce of Spiritual Success. And I was reminded of the secret sauce because you all know we have a wonderful uh, kitchen crew. Uh, Props to them. We, we were overfed this past week, as usual. Uh, and that reminded me of my grandmother. Grandma cooks like nobody else I know, even better than my dad, and he's pretty good at it. And one day I told her to teach me how to make a bean soup. Pretty common in the Latino culture. So you, if you're Cuban or Latino, you've got to make a bean soup properly. Well, she taught me how to do it. She gave me the recipe the way she's learned it. I uh, had to write things down. And I made it one day, and I tasted it, and everybody said, oh, it's, it tastes good. But I felt like something was missing. There's something missing. She didn't tell me any, everything. And, you know, she's somewhat advanced in years. So I asked her again, did you forget any condiments, anything special? Just like, no, I told you. So that day we started cooking the bean soup together. And I said, yes, I remember this. I remember that. You cut this. You slice that. You add it up. Yes. What's missing? And she said, oh, I forgot to tell you about the secret sauce. I knew it. You were holding stuff from me. And she said, the secret sauce for my bean soup is love. So, you know, and I was like, Okay, what do you mean love? Yes, I love to do it. I love to cook. I love to make the bean soup for my family. So there's always a little secret sauce in the things you do. Uh, for a Christian's life, the secret sauce would always be prayer. Prayer will get you, will get you through the hardest times of your life. Prayer will get you through the best times of your life. Prayer is the gas your car needs prayer will draw you closer to your family to your friends prayer will open up your eyes to the things that god wants you to see the things that god wants you to do so today we're going to be talking about that secret sauce that will help us to have a spiritual success a spiritual successful life so we're going to read the text this morning and then we're going to dive right in um if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Isn't it good to know that God listens to our prayers? In this context in particular, uh, First and Second Chronicles were books written to explain the uh, successful kingdoms or not so successful kingdoms and uh, kings that Israel had. So you'll have David's story and Samuel's story in First Chronicles, and then you'll get to the end of First Chronicles 
where David dies and gives the throne to his son Solomon. And you get to the first part of Second Chronicles where Solomon is becoming king of Israel. And you'll find out that he had a special request from God. He said, God, I don't want riches. I don't want popularity. I want wisdom. I want wisdom from you. You'll see that in chapter 1 and chapters 2. And then Solomon intends and wants to build a new temple. And God, if you know a little bit of the story of Israel, you'll know, you'll remember that God did not allow David to build the temple because of the mess he had created. He said, that's not for you to do. Your son, Solomon, will do it. So God allowed Solomon to build a second temple. And it's pretty interesting because Solomon was pretty opulent. He loved to do things in a great way. So if he was going to build a temple for God, he was not going to build just a little temple with a little things and a few uh, commodities. He was going to build a temple, a huge temple. Uh, and that also reminds me of our work in the Nailbender trip. Uh, we were not allowed to do many things on the second part of the house. But the first part of the house, or the, se the first house, we were allowed to do a little more work. So the things that we did had to be done with excellence. And that was Solomon. He did everything with excellence. And he had all sorts of materials. He brought people in from Egypt. He brought people in from Assyria. He, kingdoms and kings of all the area around Israel donated money, gave money, gave people, gave riches, gave talented people to build this temple. And in chapter 6, you'll see Solomon's prayer when he has built the temple already and he Praise to the Lord multiple times. You'll see in chapter 6, verses 19, 20, 21, 25, 27, 30, 31. You'll see Solomon praying the same thing over and over again. Lord, if my people are wicked, if my people are new, not doing the things they're, they're supposed to be doing, and if you stop the rain, and if you stop the crops from growing, I want you to be merciful. I want you to open up the heavens and let it rain down and bless our people. Bless our nation. And then he continues to exalt God. And by the time we get to chapter 7 and verse 12, the Lord appeals, appears sorry, to Solomon by night. And when he appears to Solomon, he says, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself. Now, in the context, he needed that guidance from God. He needed that leading, that uh pattern from God to know what to do and when to do it. And I think we all need to know what God is doing in our lives and when he's doing it. And God's desire with the book of Chronicles, first and second Chronicles, which in the Hebrew canon, it's one book. And when they were transcribing it or translating it from the Hebrew scriptures into the Septuagint and the Greek language, they divided um, the book in two because the Hebrew doesn't use as many words as the, as the Greek does. So they needed to have two books. And that's why we start with Solomon's story. Well, when they divided these verses, they thought we're going to have this translation numbered further in years. And when God says, I will shut up heaven and there will be no rain and I will command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Those were things that Israel had uh, experienced before. And now God says, if my people, which can also be translated, when my people, and he's talking specifically about the people of Israel. And I've heard other preachers say, well, it's talking about the church as well. Well, not quite. Because if we look at the context he is talking about and the writer called the chronicle uh, he says if my people the people of Israel uh, will repent now these people of Israel had experienced God tremendously and they had seen God's hand they had seen God through Abraham they had seen God through the opening of the Red Sea they had seen God through the manna in the desert and now they have a king because they wanted to have a king they had Saul first then they had David, and now they had Solomon. But God's desire with the book of Chronicles 
is to show us that He wants to dwell among us. His desire is to dwell in your heart, in my heart, among His people. Psalm 117, He says that He thought beforehand, before the, the world was created, He thought of a plan to insert Himself in history so He could dwell with us, so He could be in our hearts, in our minds. And now He says, If my people who are called by my name, I have given their name. I changed the name of Jacob and I put him Israel. And they're my people whom I redeemed, whom I have saved, whom I have changed. If they humble themselves. So there will be three main ideas, three main uh, qualities, three main conditions that an effective prayer will conduce in our lives. The first idea would be to humble themselves. Humble yourself. Now, we've talked quite a bit about humility and humbling ourselves. And we know that humbling ourselves is acknowledging our dependence on God and our need for His grace. We understand that. The problem is when we translate that into real-life decisions, we're not being humble. And let me be the first one to admit that I have a problem with pride. Because I think I know what's best, and I think I know how to control my life and my time, and I don't need anybody, anybody's advice, right? Does that happen to you? I'm sure it doesn't, because you all are much better than me. But if it does happen to you, then we're on the same boat, and we all feel like we can do better. And I don't, I don't need God's help. Why do I need somebody controlling my life? Well, that pride says, well, Lord, I'll give you my life, I'll give you my plans, but let me hold your hand. Let me guide you, because I don't think you know what you're doing. Lord, I, I want to go to Panama, but I, I don't think you know what you're doing, so I, I want to go to Panama and stay two weeks. And God maybe wants you to spend a week, or maybe God doesn't want you to go to Panama. And then we insist, and we get the things that we want. And when things go wrong, you've heard me say that. You have heard me say this before. When things go well, I get the praise. When things go wrong, God gets the beating. And our lack of humility has led us away from God, away from our, our family, away from our friends, away from our nation. So God says, if you humble yourself in the original language in the Hebrew, that humbling, it's not another word that folding your wings. You know, if you're an eagle, if you're a bird, you fold your wings because you recognize you can't go through that hole. You recognize that there's somebody, there's another bird that's stronger than you. You surrender your life. You give your life to God. You recognize that, yes, you can do things by yourself, but things are much better when you do it through God. And a humble prayer will recognize that, yes, I can do things, but I can't do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A humble prayer will always recognize the answers are in God, not in myself. A humble prayer will recognize, God, I need you. Yes, I can get up out of bed, but God, I need you to get out of bed. And especially if you're older, you'll understand what I'm saying. But if you're younger and you think you'll be young forever, you won't. And you'll need God's help to get out of bed. You'll need God's help to walk. You'll need God's help to drive. So humble prayer recognizes I need God. When we pray to God, uh, we need to recognize He's far greater than we are. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, and I'll read it real quick to you. You can jot down. I'll have a bunch of scripture to you this morning. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are not people who think they can do things by themselves. They recognize, I need God. I'm so broken. And I keep messing up, Lord. That's why I come to you. The poor in spirit recognizes, Lord, I could do it by myself, but the end results are not going to be good, so I'm going to depend on you. Humble prayer. It's the first key, the first condition for an effective prayer. 
seeking God's face. Verse 14 in Second Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. When we pray, are we praying hopeful prayers? Are our prayers desiring that God does what we're asking him to do? Are our prayers believing what we're asking God to do? See, First Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without Caesar. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. Don't leave Caesar out of the room. Don't stop praying. I remember Gabriel Ocaris, and you've heard me mention his name multiple times. Uh, when I lived with him, he had leukemia, and his wife was uh, mentally ill, and his mother-in-law was ill, so they asked me to move in with them. And he was severely sick. He was in bed. When he got up, he went to the restroom. I heard him say something really low, like mumble, and I, I didn't know what he was saying. And then he would go to bed and he would say something else and I didn't know what he was saying. He would go to the kitchen to get water and he would say something I didn't know what he was saying. So I asked him one day, what are you talking about? What, what are you mumbling and trying to say? I can't hear you. And you know, my ears catch, catch all the sound. And it's like, I'm praying. You're going to pee and you're praying? Alan, I need God when I go to the market. I need God when I go to drink water. I need God when I go to get up in bed, from bed, when I go to bed. I need God when I talk to my friends. So I learned from Gabriel to pray when I go to the grocery store. I learned from Gabriel to pray when I'm sick, to pray when I'm healthy, to pray when I'm happy, to pray when I'm sad. Pray without ceasing. See, I think one of the greatest problems, if not the greatest problem, we have in the church today, not only in America, this happens in Cuba too, is that Christians don't pray. And Jay has said it before, the statistics, what is it, 5% of the uh, Southern Baptist Convention pastors pray five minutes or something like that. So if the pastors pray five minutes a day, what's left for the non-pastors, the regular members of the church? How much are we praying? How much are we seeking God's face? How much are we coming to the Lord? How much are we coming to the Lord's house in prayer, believing that what we're asking for Him to do will actually happen? See, sometimes we pray. The problem is not that we don't pray. The problem is we pray that we don't hope that that will happen. We don't believe that that will happen. It is as if well, God, I, I've heard from the Bible, from my Sunday school teacher, that you can heal. So might as well pray and say, can you heal my sister? Eh. Lord, I've heard that you can, you know, take the dent of a car. I don't know that that will work, but I'll pray anyway. So we don't really believe what we're praying about. No wonder why we don't get our answers. And I'm i got to admit, I'm the first one to do that. 1 Peter 5, 6. Peter said, Peter said, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. When we pray regularly, individually, when we desire to be with God, he will exalt us. He will put us in the place in the position that we need to be in. So the first key to the correct prayer, to an effective prayer, will be humbling ourselves. The second one would be seeking God's face. It's desiring an intimacy and communion with God. See, Hebrews 11:6. For it is necessary, it is a must, that you have faith, believing that when you pray, God will do it. In Isaiah 55, 6, I love this one because I remembered it in Spanish this morning as I talked to Larry and I said, I have to write this down and I have to remember my people about this. Um, Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Here's the cool thing about it. Jay says it all the time. God wants to speak to us 
far more than what we want to listen to him. And he is always near. So when we sing, draw me close to you, we should actually be singing, draw myself to you, force me to do it. Because I really don't want to do it sometimes, Lord. I feel like praying, but I don't want to pray. I feel like reading my Bible, but I don't want to read my Bible. I feel like coming to church, but I don't come to church. I feel like tithing, but I don't do it. Because it's all a rule. It's all a, I have to check the box and I have to pretending we can please God and we can't please God with our actions. Romans says clearly our actions cannot buy grace. So rules without relationships lead to a mess. But relationships without rules lead to rebellion. God has said his word and he said if you pray, if you seek my face, if you desire to find the answer, I will give it to you. Or I will change your mind. I will change your perspective. The third one, the third key, the third condition for effective prayer would be turning from your wicked ways, from my wicked ways. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and that turning would be translated as a single word, repentance. We know what repentance is. We've heard it enough. But are we repenting? And repentance always brings a sense of sorrow. A sense of, I know I did something wrong. I know I sinned against God. I know I sinned against my wife and my kids and my friends and my neighbors and myself. Repenting is recognizing what we did wrong. And stop doing it. Just stop. The Bible says in, in one part in the New Testament. He who uh, stole. Don't steal no more. He who lied. Don't lie no more. And I know it's not that easy. But we got to turn from our wicked ways. And what would the results of that be? What is God's promise? Well in the text. He promised to Solomon. He would heal the land. He will forgive them of their sins. Now, there's literal application for the Israelites healing the land. They were hurt. They were divided. And I know some of us don't believe that there will be a national revival. We don't believe that there might be a national unity. And that might be true. But if we don't pray, hoping that God can do it, because I tell you, God can do it, regardless of you believing or not. And God can change whoever's going to be the president and turn this nation toward God. But we as the people of God, we should pray. We should repent. We should seek his face. So God has promised to restore and renew the spiritual life and emotional life and physical aspects of our lives and community. But as a church, we have failed to pray. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, He will forgive us of our sins. If we confess with our mouths, if we believe in our hearts that He is the Lord, He shall forgive us, He shall cleanse us. He also promises forgiveness of sin. God's grace and mercy in response to our genuine repentance. When we have genuinely repented, it doesn't matter how evil you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. He will forgive you. There's that grace from God. So it doesn't matter what your background is. It does not matter what you did yesterday or this morning. If you truly repented, if you have understood, I did wrong, I sinned against God, against myself, against my friends and the people around me, and you come to God in repentance, recognizing that only He can forgive you, that only He can change you. The Bible says He throws our, your sins and my sins to the depth of the ocean and remembers no longer. He doesn't remember anymore. He doesn't have a list of things, a naughty list of things you've done and keeps them to get you under the bush and say, I got you, Jay. I know what you did. He knows what you did. But he also sees the blood of Jesus Christ applied in your life. 
healing you, changing you, transforming you. Are we perfect? We are not. But we ought to strive to get closer to God in prayer. We ought to strive to come to the Lord individually, to come to the Lord corporately and come in prayer. And then we'll find healing and restoration for our lives. And then we'll find forgiveness for our sins. And God will hear our prayers. See, the Psalms are full of uh, poetry telling God, hear my prayer, O Lord. But the Psalms are also full of lines saying, Lord, you heard my prayer. Lord, you answered my prayer. So I don't know what you've been praying for. I don't know what you've been praying about. But the Lord is hearing you. Come to the Lord with genuine faith. Come to the Lord with a humble spirit. Come to the Lord seeking His face, trying to find His will. And I tell you, I tell you where you can find His will. In the Word of God. If you don't know what to pray, pray the Scriptures. If you don't know when to pray, pray at all times. There's no right or wrong. There are no magic words. There are no fancy words you can use. I'm also reminded of the story of the Pharisee and the publican. And I'm, I don't know if you know the story, but I'll remind you in a little second. The Pharisee was praying in the temple and he was praying to himself. That's what the Greek says. He was praying to himself. And when he was praying, he said, Thank you, Lord, because I'm not like such and such. Who come and they don't offer and they don't serve you as I do. Thank you, Lord. And he was praying to himself. And I'm afraid many of us pray to ourselves many times. I've been there on that and then you get the miserable man the sinner who says Lord be good to me be merciful have mercy on me because I am not worthy to even pray I'm not even worthy to come into the temple I'm not even worthy to come into the exterior part of the temple and I recognize my lack before you but I need you Lord I need you every hour I need you my one defense, Lord, I need you. So if you need God, you can come to God. He will always have open arms for you. It doesn't matter what if you've done. All you need to have is the humble attitude in your heart, recognizing that He is God and you are not, that He can change you, that He can heal you. You need to seek His face with consistent prayer. We pray, but we are not constant on it. And we get tired. The woman came to the judge. And she was insisting in her request. And the judge got tired one day. And he said, you know what? I'll just give it to her so I can get rid of her. I don't think God wants to get rid of us. But he wants to have a relationship with us. And I tell you, who gets the most benefits from that relationship? We do. So come to God. Come to God with a humble spirit. Come to God seeking His face and come to God repenting of your sins. That's the only way. See, Christ came to pay the ultimate price. That is the gospel. We talked about it with the youth. He came born of a virgin in a manger. He humbled Himself so you and I could have access to the Father. He died on the cross, but He's not dead. He's alive. He is God. He is alive. He is eternal. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. So when you read the Bible, when you read Scripture, you will see Jesus in it. So First Chronicles represents Jesus. Because God wanted a temple so He could dwell among His people. Well, guess what? When you come to Christ, when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior... And He has redeemed you. He dwells in your life through the Holy Spirit. And then He changes you. And you no longer get a choosing of yourself if you're truly saved. You're wanting to come to God at all times. You're wanting to pray. You're wanting to humble yourself. You're wanting to repent. So, three conditions. Three keys for an effective prayer. An effective secret sauce for spiritual, spiritual success. You humble yourself, you seek God's face, and you turn from your wicked ways. So maybe, 
we need to think about a few key factors, a few ideas for prayer individually and corporately. You know, every Monday night we have a prayer time at 7.30. And I, the reason I come, and Becky and I have talked about this, it's become probably my favorite service this church has. And it's just, we come here and we hang out and we joke for a little bit, but we pray. And we pray for each other. And let me tell you, when I have been very discouraged, when I have been very hurt, when I have been very tired, prayer time has gotten me through it. Monday night's prayer time have gotten me through it. And I know in Cuba, when you go to the church services, people show up because of tran transportation issues as well. But they show up up to an hour early so they can pray. They don't say hi to each other. They don't kiss each other. They don't catch up. They pray. They pray for each other. They pray for themselves. They pray for the pastor. And as I was reading last week, I was reminded of the story of Spurgeon in England. Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers in the history of humanity. And one day he had a bunch of young people come to his church. They didn't know who he was. And he, they were just wanting to see the whole building. So he was showing them around. And he said, do you want to see the pipes in the back of the church? You know, the water pipes. Well, no, nobody wants to see that. And they didn't want to be disrespectful. So, you know, they, they agreed and they went with him. And he showed them the pipes and then he redirected them to a little room in the back. And when he opened the door, 700 people were kneeling, praying. And he says, that's how I get through my sermon. That's how I get through my, my week. We have disestimated prayer so much that it's no wonder this country is crazy. But I believe, and the Bible shows us, that if we pray and we humble ourselves and we repent, verse 15, his eyes will be open. His ears will be attentive to the prayers made in this place. Made in your kitchen. So, our busyness and our distractions keep us away. And getting caught, uh, caught up in daily tasks and distractions is easy in our uh, uh, fast-paced lives. So, to overcome this, maybe you need to set a specific time for prayer. Whether it's in the morning... Whether it's in the afternoon, or lunchtime, lunch break, in the evening before you go to bed and you don't fall asleep. Maybe you need to uh, minimize your distractions. Put your phone away. Pray, pray in a place where you don't have a phone, where you don't have a computer, where you don't have a TV. Like the movie, have a prayer closet, a prayer room. Our lack of motivation and discipline sometimes is also a factor uh, that helps us to struggle with our prayer. So we, we struggle to get motivated or disciplined at anything. You want to learn Spanish, but you don't really put the effort into it. You don't schedule yourself. You don't pay the price. So maybe you should start small. Don't try to pray for two, five, twenty hours a day. What about five minutes in the morning? Five minutes in the afternoon? For no particular reason, just pray to God and say, Lord, I don't even know what to say. My little sister, when she was three, she didn't know how to read, obviously. And she had the alphabet in front of her. And she, was, she knew enough to arrange the alphabet from A to Z. And she was arranging it and was saying something in her mind. And you could hear her. And I asked her, what are you doing? She said, I'm rearranging the letters, hoping that God will understand my prayer. He understands your prayers. He knows what you're saying. Those unspoken requests, they don't need a name. God knows what they are. So maybe you need to start small and create a habit. Five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, one minute. Maybe you need to use prayer tools. Like we have the Bible app. And we have journals. And we have devotionals to structure our prayers. And to keep our lives engaged to that prayer maybe we have also battled or fought against our spiritual dryness or doubt being there done that 
There are seasons when prayer might feel dry or doubts abound in our heads. But maybe you need to be honest with God and say, God, I, I don't even know if I believe what I believe. I don't even know if you're real. But be honest with God. Psalms are full of those honest prayers to the Lord. He can take it. He died on the cross. He can take anything. So he understands and desires our genuine communication. Maybe you also need to seek community. And one of the problems in the American church is we don't come to church regularly. We come when we feel like it, when we think we are important, when we are needed. But we don't have a consistency of attendance to our churches. So that also doesn't motivate us to pray or read our Bibles. And this is why we come to church. So I can have the worship team minister to my life and encourage my life to pray to God, to read my Bible. And I need a pastor who encourages me to repent, to humble myself, to come to the Lord. So you need a friend. You need a, a sister. You need a brother who will encourage you to come to the Lord in prayer. Maybe you have felt overwhelmed by the prayer request. The volume of prayer requests that we have can be a little bit overwhelming. So maybe you prioritize your prayers. You focus on a daily or weekly prayer need uh, to avoid feeling overwhelmed. Just have people's names separated and pray for them daily or weekly or monthly. And you can also trust God's sovereignty. He knows what he's doing. You understand that God hears every prayer and he knows what is best. And you give him the concerns you have. Maybe your lack of understanding or structure. And people may not know what to do, what to say, or when to say it. Maybe you can learn from others. And you learn as you watch others do it, and you learn as you do it. So you can study examples of prayers in the Bible, in the Psalms, or spiritual mentors. We need somebody to pour into us. I need somebody to pour into my life as much as I pour into others' lives. You maybe need to use prayer guides or scriptures to guide your prayers for different aspects of life, whether it's family, work, community. Pray through the scriptures. Spiritual warfare, which is not used in many churches these days. There's real spiritual opposition against your life. And the enemy is not happy with you being here this morning. And as soon as you leave that place and you go into the mission field, he will try if it's not trying right now, to distract your mind and to distort your peace. So we need to put on the armor of God as we pray. Don't take it off to take a shower. Don't take it off to go to bed. Put it on. Pray for spiritual protection and use scripture to fight against these spiritual attacks. And be persistent in prayer. Don't give up. Continued prayer strengthens spiritual resilience. And overcoming these challenges requires intentional effort. And reliance on God's grace and strength. We can't do it on our own. We need God. We need our brothers and sisters. We can't do it on our own. So the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man and woman can do a lot. So as you humble yourself, as you seek God, and as you repent, let me encourage you this morning, this week, this month, to set up those times for prayer. Whether it's individually, whether it's corporately on Monday nights, and come to the Lord. And if you need to repent, you can start this morning coming and repenting. If you need to make peace with God or a brother or a sister, don't wait another day. Today's the day. If you need to be saved from your sins, today's the day of salvation. Christ died on the cross so you could have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So as we pray this morning, I'm going to ask you to gently... Touch the person next to you and pray for them. And pray with them. And I'm going to ask you to ask God to bless them, to bless her. 
And I'm going to ask you to pray for yourself as way as well. Pray to the Lord that He will humble you. Pray to the Lord that He will teach you how to seek His face. And pray to the Lord that He will help you know what you need to repent of. Father, this morning we come to you. And Lord, I pray that the meditation of my heart and the meditations of my mind are pleasing to you, Lord. Lord, we come to you humbly recognizing that you are God and we are not. And Lord, there are many things in our heads and many things in our hearts that we don't understand. So I pray, Lord, that you strengthen, straighten up our ways, that you strengthen your presence in our lives, and that your presence is so strong in our lives that we are left with nothing else but repentance. Lord, help us to be your sanctuary. Help us to be that pleasing sanctuary in which you dwell. And as we come forward to you, Lord, I pray that we recognize that we need you at all times. Let us please stand. God wants to have a relationship with you. He's not interested in you living a religious life. Uh, Religion doesn't work. It didn't work for the Pharisees. It didn't work for the Romans. It hasn't worked for thousands of years. He's interested in you having a relationship with Him, a vibrant relationship with Him. And if you don't have one with Him, maybe you need to start that this morning. And if you've lost track of your relationship with the Lord, Maybe you need to come back to the Lord. His arms are open for you. He's always willing to have you back because you're His child. So come to Christ. Now's the time. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Happy birthday to you, 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. I tried to jump in. I tried to do that like in the middle of the song. I get to do that one time a year. I had one job. Uh, do remember our prayer time tomorrow at 7.30. And uh, the youth will be leading worship on July 28th, Sunday. So you might not want to miss that.